Welcome to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. This is the only podcast that gives you a raw and unfiltered perspective of what it's really like to be a professional cheerleader. Whether you're currently on a pro team, an alumni, or really curious about what it takes to become a pro cheerleader, the Pro Cheerleading Podcast gives you all the inside scoop and hot topics in the pro cheerleading industry and in-depth interviews of current and former cheerleaders. I'm your host, Makiba. Join me every Wednesday as I reveal the truth behind the palms. Welcome ye to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. This episode is all about you and your wonderful film, A Woman's Work, The NFL's Cheerleader Problem. I just can't tell you how much I am just so excited to talk to you this episode. We have been waiting for you to come to Seattle for so long now, and this coronavirus better not mess up the film festival next, not next week, it's in a couple of weeks, so maybe. Actually, I do have an update about that. Oh no, don't tell me they can't see it. <laughs> So because, uh, you know, there was an order to cancel events of a certain size, so the the theater and I both decided that I think it would be wise to to reschedule the screening. And anyone who has bought tickets, like, they'll still honor it further down the road. But right now with the situation of coronavirus, just, you know, people don't know what's going to happen is developing so fast, I think, in terms of public safety and stuff, they just decided it's better to reschedule. Okay. I just looked at the site earlier this afternoon and they didn't have any yeah. announcements. So I was having, I mean, especially for smaller venues, I would think that it might be okay, but I guess the whole point is not to gather and to stay spread apart. And Yeah. Uh, that's so it's, disappointing. It's unfortunate. I know it's really unfortunate, but it's going to still happen. It's right. just like, we just need things to let, calm down. We just need yes. things to calm down. Yes. And yes. Okay, well, then that means I'll have to be a little bit more patient, but you have to let me know if I need to be quiet and not give away any spoilers, but I just am so excited to talk about the film, the process of making it, everything that you've observed, learned, all of that. So let's get started. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I'm excited. Well, you mentioned possibly being down for some cheer chat, so I just want to, like, while we're on the core can I stop saying coronavirus? Like, I don't know why that is the way it wants to come out every single time. But I was actually supposed to travel to Portland on Uh Sunday um, to go watch the Houston Rockets game and enjoy the Blazer dancers perform with Rip City crew. Like, I was just so excited. I was going to be lazy and fly down there instead of drive. This was, you know, back before all this stuff took off. But Just saw the announcement yesterday from the NBA about, you know, postponing the whole season. Yeah. It's just really getting real. And uh, I just can't imagine, you know, for the dancers that have like 40 some odd games during the season, it's like their season's pretty much, I think it's kind of getting closer to the end of NBA, but still like right when all the momentum's building. Yeah. It's heading toward the playoffs. I mean, yeah, it's it's crazy. So crazy. So I'm super bummed about that. Now the film festival. I don't know what else people <laughs> canceled here, but um, how's it been where you are? Well, LA, I don't know. I work from home, so I generally kind of don't go out that much, but I've been trying to, in a way, you know, whatever they call it, social distancing now, you know. I was supposed to go up to Big Bear actually um, this weekend with some friends, but we decided not to go. And yeah. so it's it's a little weird. I don't know. Definitely a lot of uncertainty. Like you don't really know what's going to happen. Plus my family, I was born in China um, and mm-hmm. lived there till I was six. So a lot of my family is in China in a city called Chongqing, which is like maybe an hour away from Wuhan where the epicenter of this happened. And, you know, since December, it's been like, there's a social media app called WeChat, which Chinese oh, yeah. people use to like message each other all the time. I got kicked so off been, of WeChat for some reason. Did you say something like politically sensitive? <laughs> no, I don't even know what happened. Um, it's not to cut you off, but um, when I was at Starbucks, I became yeah. buddies with some of partners from our um, Shanghai office. And so oh, they uh, be on WeChat and we're going back and forth sharing pictures from their visit to Seattle. And then all of a sudden I couldn't access the app. I couldn't download it again. Like nothing. It was that's it's so like, weird. I like that I, app though. It was fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's like a combination of like Facebook and, um, you know, What's a that? messaging app. Yeah. But yeah. it's just been constantly like updates on what, on what's happening. Like my uncle, like my family, they don't go out. They alternate, like according to your house number, they alternate days where you can leave the house. So <laughs> you're actually not allowed to go out. And my grandparents are in a senior living home. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and no one is allowed to go in and out. My grandpa's 95. So he's just been really confused. Like he's pretty much deaf, so he can't really hear. And so Mm -hmm. communicating with him has been horrible and his, he's had some health issues and he had to go to the hospital. So it was just like really scary for a long time. And now it's kind of finally hitting the U S and I'm not sure what the government is doing right now. Like I'm kind of very confused about that. So that doesn't really help calm your fears. Uh, No, not at all. (laughs) I can't even listen to the press conferences because I'm like, I (laughs) like every Um, moment is like, are you serious? Yeah. (laughs) Well, the latest rumor is that the national guard is on its way to Seattle. Like as we speak and no way. Yeah, who knows? What to do what? I, I, that's what I'm figuring out. Like, are you going to make sure we don't leave our house? Like, I think it's just extremely confusing and kind of scary. Now my kids are going to be home until yeah. April 24th. Wow. Are I, they in college or high school or no, what? high school and middle school? And so, oh, wow. but you know, private and public schools in the three counties here in Washington State are now just shut down, and that's an extremely long time. And they're trying to get some like emergency food um, to continue to try to feed the kids that were, you know, on free or reduced lunch that I yeah. think relied on being in school to eat. So it's just kind of like utter chaos, utter chaos. Yeah. But, um, I, and I wonder if this is going to impact, you know, the NFL season, because, you know, that's coming down the road in terms mm-hmm. of season. But however, the other thing that is potentially going to impact the season is the collective bargaining agreement uh, oh, that's sure. going around right now. Yeah, there's so much going on. Yeah. So uh, because of the NBA's announcement to postpone or like to take this hiatus, the NFL did make a statement that they don't plan on changing their season start date. So all of their preseason activities that happen, like from conditioning and all of that, Mm -hmm. it's supposed to still happen. I mean, I don't know in terms of the CBA, like where things are. It's a lot. There's so much going on. I mean, it's kind of juicy and just understanding how it trickles down and you know, with audition season right now in the NFL as well, like that's getting at least 100 plus 200 women together, women and men, you know, working out, sweating the whole nine yards. I'm <laughs> curious if I know that the Seahawks postponed or canceled their audition prep workshop. Uh, wow. I'm just curious to see if any of the dates will slide for auditions um, for some of the teams because of this too. So it's hitting home in a lot of crazy ways. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I'm seeing even for dancers that, you know, follow on Instagram, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, make money from teaching classes and yeah, you know, they pay yeah. classes to train and everything is just messing with everybody's schedule, money, opportunities, dancing, yeah, like everything, exactly. off. everything's um, off. I saw on Twitter that you posted, maybe it was like yesterday or something, something about the Mavs dancer. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Can we even talk about that? Wait, why not? <laughs> <laughs> While we're chair chatting, uh, so you might have heard one of the episodes uh, since yeah, you've been listening, listening, listening um, of how fond I am of the Mavs president or CEO Cynthia Marshall. Yeah, but, Cynthia, yeah. Uh huh. So they went a little dark. I was obsessively watching towards the end of the summer to figure out what they were up to, since they definitely started the NBA season without any dancers. And I missed the announcement of them partnering with World of Dance for performances. But, oh, yeah, I saw that recently. Yeah, yeah. but um, apparently, I just love our listeners because they'll slide into the DMs anonymously and kind of give me the skinny on what's what. And uh, someone shared that article and I was just like seething because I love the person who wrote it because he at least kind of seemed to have the heart sarcasm a little bit of just yeah. like, how are you just going to sneak and put out a team to perform like out of nowhere it's like midway through the season or p- past that and all of a sudden you have like tumblers and stunters and dancers and like this whole little circus that they even were bragging about forming a long time ago but she is a piece of work that Cynthia I cannot with her but I had to post the article because I just it's just like look at here this is what we have yeah, and it, I think it was saying, like, it includes, like, five or a handful of former Mavs dancers or something who have been mm-hmm. practicing, and, like, I don't know. It's just, it's mind-boggling in terms of, like, when they announced, like, oh, we're going to change th- things up, and then it just sounded like they were throwing, like, everything out there. Like, it's going to be everything and anything, like, magic, <laughs> like, animals or whatever. Like, yeah. what? It, there was no clear direction, you know, and I think this this is kind of sliding into, like, what, you know, we were going to talk about mm-hmm. film and stuff, but it's also like, you know, the cheerleaders, the dance crew, the dance team, you're a part of the brand. You're like, 
you know, literally a part of the family that you perform on the game days, you're recognized as representing the brand of the team. And so if you're going to change that up and then you're going to be like, oh, it could be like a variety show of like anyone and and anything. Like, I don't think that's going to contribute to your brand. That's going to like take away, that's going to dilute your brand, you know? Girl, you could not have said it better. Like, I'm convinced because that woman was so stern about her decision and kind of forceful with her vision of how this was all supposed to work. I mean, I don't know what fan she had in mind. I mean, you just saw the quote in the article where she mentions a 10-year-old kid that comes to a game, shouldn't have to cover their eyes. But I think... Exactly. But I think, you know, to have however many games have transpired throughout the NBA season so far without any real entertainment other than the Dallas maniacs that are just big guys, chubby guys dancing or what have you. I'm sure they got some feedback, right? They had to get some fan feedback. And I heard that the World of Dance performance that they did have, I don't know, I just maybe they realized that doing that on a regular basis for games is just not feasibly possible or practical. Um, But to hold, not even like hold auditions, do it all under the radar, just hella shady about it. Like, it's like very shady. And in the article, it mentions something like you're not allowed to say dancers or something like the word dancers is not a thing. It has to be the tumbling team or something. Um, It's like so weird. It's like the elephant in the room or something like you're (laughs) she's creating this taboo and making the word dancer some kind of taboo. She hurts me to no end. I am just actually getting started with commentary on that article. I think you might see a little bit more from me (laughs) on Twitter about that one. It's not that I'm about trolling anybody. I just think, you know. It's like holding her. There might be a fine line between like trolling and holding someone accountable, you know, like. Exactly. I'm all about accountability (laughs) and you just can't. I care so much about this community of dancers and you just can't get away with stuff. I mean, maybe before we kind of had each other as hopefully like more of a community that are more connected and are sharing information that are trying to have each other's backs. I mean, somebody has to stand up and say, come on, man, like, come on. And I don't know what they have in store and now they don't have any games at all. So we'll see. Yeah. What well, My eyes yeah. are on their behinds and I definitely still have some stuff to say. Very, very curious. Yeah. How- Porter ended up writing about it because it was an article Mm -hmm. definitely dedicated to that issue. And, you know, there've been other reporters that did uh, write about the whole situation in Dallas, uh, Paige Skinner and a couple other people, I believe. One that was a former Malice Dabs, whoa, Dallas Mavs dancer. And so it'll be interesting. I'm here for it. Now it's going to die down a little bit probably because of no games, but yeah. Nice way to try to sneak on a dance team without going through the proper channels. Yeah, my husband is from Dallas, so that's also one reason I was like paying attention to that. But also, I feel like it could be an interesting time just because now that there's not going to be games for the for the rest of the season, it could almost be the time really to jump in and you know have a say, and like put out your voice and mm-hmm. try to get in there in terms of making some changes. And yeah. I don't know what is possible or not possible, but like it could be a good time to actually speak up. I think so too. Perfect timing. We have enough of the time over these next few weeks when everybody's like working from home and hope probably going stir crazy. Thanks for talking some current events really quick. It's a lot going on. So yeah. I'm ready to dig all up into your film though, girl. Let's just. Okay. <laughs> so I'm horrible at bios and intros, but I just do want to give you your shout out. So you went to USC, right? With the, and got your right. MFA in film production and you're an award-winning filmmaker, right? I mean, let's just pump you up real quick. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> you have a long <laughs> list of films, and you focus primarily on documentaries. Is that right? Yeah, for the past five years or so. So I started two documentaries in 2014, um, <laughs> A Woman's Work, this one, and another film called Who is Arthur Chu, which follows this Asian-American Jeopardy champion. They're very different oh. films on the surface, but actually there's some common themes. But anyway, for the past five years, I've been working on these two films primarily. And I actually started another film in 2016 um, in collaboration with my dad, who is a visual artist called Interior Migrations. And it follows uh, Jamaican migrant workers in Ontario, Canada. Wow. Yeah. So they actually 
work eight months of the year in the fruit orchards um, up in Ontario on the farms and orchards. And then they go home for, you know, two months, three months of the year and then come back. And some of these guys have been doing it for 30 years. It's, it's a bit of like an experimental documentary where it looks at, you know, their memories and their dreams and thoughts as they're working in contrast to sort of the grueling work, like over 12 hour work day that they have to do. <laughs> You know, wow. So how is it even so yeah for you to do more than one film at one time? Maybe that's just a really naive question, but that sounds super ambitious and impressive to actually manage yeah. everything that goes into film production for more than one film at a time. It is a lot of like multitasking, balancing the different productions. But um, one thing is with independent documentary filmmaking, like I'm not working for a big corporation like whatever Vice or... I don't know, whatever other network I'm working for myself. And then I find funding for my own projects. So it's kind of like a small business slash, you know, freelance type of work where you're just managing your own projects and funding comes in small chunks. So we get a chunk of money for development um, and then we get some more money to shoot some thing and then more money from a funder to develop it further and keep going and then another chunk for post-production. So it's really like finding the funding like piece by piece. Um, and so sometimes if you don't have funding, you're not shooting or you're not really doing anything because yeah. you can't afford to pay people or whatever. So, and also also, you know, like for the films that I did finish, I'm not filming with people like every day, you know, or yeah. every week. Like I, we will schedule like, for example, I'll, you know, for a woman's work, I had to fly to Buffalo a lot because one of the characters, one of the women is from Buffalo. She was a Buffalo Jills dancer. So we would schedule like two weeks, you know, shooting in Buffalo okay. um, in this time period. And then we would come back to LA, you know, download the footage, look at the footage, try to get more funding and then go back like a month or two later. So within those breaks, then I can hop on to, you know, some of my other films that I've been working on. And so <laughs> it's just like a juggling act. No, that's good though. That probably also keeps your brain stimulated to some extent. Yeah. So you're completely burnt out on like one project at a time and being able yeah. to have a diverse portfolio of things that you're looking at is probably yeah. probably helpful. Exactly. So it's it's a, it's a lot of variety. And I think for me, I feel so honored and privileged to do my job. I yeah. mean, I think I've heard so many cheerleaders say that too, that they're honored and privileged. <laughs> um, but I truly am because, you know, I'm allowed to like talk to people I would never ever talk to you if I didn't do this work I get to understand them I get to ask them about their deepest fears and their passions um you know to be a witness to all the highs and lows the joys and sadness of their life and really try to piece that into a story and share it with more people so I think that's an honor and it's real these are real people it's not just actors that get paid to play a role like these are real people with real lives and I think a lot of filmmakers sometimes don't treat that with as much respect as they should, you know, like filmmakers expect a lot from the people, people that they're filming, like, oh, I need this for the scene or whatever. But I really try to give respect and power to the women in my film. You, you can definitely tell. So everybody, I did get a chance to see the film and I really can't wait for you all to see it. So I'm going to try not to just talk through every point because I want there to be some you know, reason to just hold on until you have an opportunity to see it for yourselves. But I did feel like you were very, very respectful to the women in your film, especially in those tougher moments. I just felt like there was grace, for lack of a better word, and never a time where I would have been like, oh my God, I would have want the camera out of my face. You know what I mean? Like I, there were some yeah. tougher moments, I think, that you captured mm -hmm. in the film, but in a way that gave it, I think, the right space that it probably needed in that moment. So very well yeah. done. Seriously, we how did you end up selecting this topic to focus on for this film? People always ask that in a, with a, a slight hint of kind of like incredulity, like when they look at me, like what made you as, you know, you want to do this film? And I always tell people the story about, you know, I, again, was born in China, raised in Canada, didn't know anything about football. We didn't have cheerleading. It, Vancouver does have, you know, the BC oh, Lions. But yep. mm -hmm. no, no one, to be honest, no one went to see their games. Everyone oh, was going to watch the Canucks. Like, obviously, yes, hockey, hockey was the biggest thing. There were several riots surrounding hockey. But I went to USC in LA for graduate school, for film school. And as an international student, 
you're not allowed to work off campus. So I got a job tutoring at school and I tutored football players um, and some other student athletes. So that was basically the height of the Pete Carroll era, actually, because, you know, he was walking around, <laughs> like driving around his golf cart. He was so nice, by the way. He would say hi to everyone. He always had like a very positive vibe about him. Um, so I always have a great impression of him. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I first learned about football by tutoring them. And I saw like they didn't care at all about the assignment, the essay that they had to write about like whatever book. They were just concerned about the next workout, like the game, like preparing for the game. Everything was their whole life revolved around the game. Yeah. And then, you know, and then I realized, holy crap, like this is so popular it's like a religion i mean people say it's america's favorite pastime and that's when i started to you know watch a lot of movies about football i you know watch friday night lights like the tv show and the movie you just get into it you get into the mythology the storylines like the underdog storylines you know especially when it's like friday night lights is a small town in texas it's like dealing with class like race poverty like all these things and you can see just how much the game of football and the world of football reflects the history and the sort of dna of the united states and for me as as a foreigner to this country as an immigrant you know that was really fascinating i wanted to like learn more about it and you know just really immerse myself and that's when i, I read this article in the la times about Lacey's lawsuit Mm -hmm. said she was paid less than minimum wage when you factor in all the hours that she worked for practices everything and like what she was paid at the end of the season which by the way is illegal because you have to get paid in california every two weeks actually mm -hmm. anyway, <laughs> um, so that just blew my mind and i think for me also this is a personal film because it's about women it's about inequality that we all face and for me, born in China under the one child policy, I was not welcome when I was born. That's like this original trauma slash scar mm -hmm. that I hold in myself. And I think, you know, a lot of women hold that scar when you realize you are a second class citizen. You're not treated as equal to men and to no fault of your own. You didn't make that choice to not be a man. Like, you know what I mean? And that's something that is very unjust <laughs> when i read that article it's, that just rang true to that part of me that has always felt that way and you know I've, i felt like it would be a really interesting opportunity for me to look at sort of the power dynamics the gender dynamics of this multi-billion dollar industry while also getting to know this woman Lacey like how you know where does she come from how does she get into cheerleading um what was her dream like what made her decide to actually go through with the lawsuit like everything I want to know everything about her because for me that's one of I guess is one of my passions is to find out things about people to understand people to gain that connection with people I think everybody you know it's like a basic human instinct is to find connection but for me I think I'd love to do that through my work so, so how that's did, kind of how it started how did Lacey uh respond when you first approached her about hey I'm not just like interested in doing an article about you or you know kind of like I've heard about it I think it's interesting but this is somebody approaching you saying I'd like to feature you in a documentary. What was her reaction like? Yeah, because so at that time, her lawsuit had just come out. They filed it like, I think, a week before the Super Bowl of that year. Um, so it caused a huge media reaction, like around the world. Like she had, you know, reporters from Al Jazeera. She had reporters from the UK, from Europe, come to her off the lawyer's office in Oakland to interview her. It was like one after another. So she probably, you know, talked to a million people. And when I approached one of her lawyers, Leslie, to introduce myself, um, you know, I want to make a feature, a longer documentary following Lacey. I made it clear that, you know, I wanted to be about her experience growing and changing as a woman through this very sort of tumultuous time in her life. And so I went up to meet Lacey and Leslie in Oakland. And I also, you know, voiced this to Lacey and we just chatted about whatever, like childhood and things like that. And it was just like, I think she, she pretty much found it to be clear that I'm not interested in just 
being like, what's the headline? What's the, you know, cool yeah. headline I can generate from this? Like I told her, like, I want to follow you for at least a year to see what happens. Like, what are you going to do now that you're not allowed to dance anymore in any That's professional true. teams? Like, mm-hmm. what are you going to do? And I think we also bonded because, you know, she's from a small town in Louisiana, but we both grew up in working class families. Like my, when my parents immigrated to Canada, to Vancouver, they were working like three, four jobs, like laundromat, you know, pizza delivery, blah, blah, blah. And I saw my mom, especially like she was working full time outside the home and full time inside the home. Right. And we both had that kind of gratitude and, you know, respect towards our mothers. And I think we both understood the value of hard work, like, cause we came from that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, there was a, you know, a good connection that was formed. And she's also just very generous and very open. It's like that Southern hospitality. Thing. Oh my gosh, I mean, both of the women in the film. But yeah, Lacey absolutely had the Southern charm and uh, very yeah. open and sincere, I think, in, in every way, in the way that she represented herself. I mean, you got a glimpse into her whole entire life. She had yeah. babies over the time that you guys had been filming. Yeah. So, so much bravery with her. I mean, she was the first one. Because I think there's a perception of like the women that maybe have come forward and sued their teams for wages or, or treatment or what have you that, and that they are like attention seekers or that they're doing it for some wrong reason, whatever that could be. But, you know, this was a woman who... Um, had cheered in the NBA or danced in the NBA. Yeah, for the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, I had a wonderful experience, you know, thinking I'll just go and cheer for the Oakland Raiderettes, probably expecting a very similar experience to what she had at Golden State, only to find that it was drastically different. I just really appreciated just her firm, very kind of straightforward discussion of the light bulb that probably went off for everybody, right? Of, hey, this just doesn't seem right just curious how that sparked off because I'm just really glad that she was open to being followed throughout that experience yeah and I think first one yeah for sure it was very I mean at the same time I think I want to make it clear that was very difficult for her to make that decision and I I tried to make that clear through the film too that it was like you know a lot of back and forth because even from listening to your podcast it's something so special this experience is unparalleled. It's a world that is unparalleled, like in terms of the relationships, in terms of the job, right? Like it's insane. You have to give that up. And I think it was so difficult for her. And it was so difficult afterwards, after she made that decision. And similarly for, you know, Maria, who is from Buffalo and any of the other women that stood up and said something in 2014 and in 2018, like Mm -hmm. your life is changed forever you know forever you cannot go back in some ways it's like a you know it's like a fall from grace in many people's eyes yeah that's the part that's the most uh disturbing I would say and I've already gone on some rants you guys will have to go back and listen if you really want to hear it again I'll try not to get too fired up this episode but I think that's the part that's been the most heartbreaking for me just knowing the reason that I wanted to start the podcast was because of just wanting to have this community and sense of like, here's a safe space where we can talk about all of these issues. And, you know, that's how, that's the first few episodes is talking about, you know, everything that popped off in 2018. And this was all happening real time, but I didn't really think about the women being ostracized with coming out in that way. Um, Especially because I was like, well, we're talking about it. You know, I thought they were like on the media circuit, they were doing a million interviews. Mm -hmm. I was like, they're probably way too busy to talk to this brand new podcast that just formed. But but it is really heartbreaking because you're so right. They're giving up an incredible experience that was not all bad. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like you said, it's unmeasurable, like how unique the experience of dancing and NFL, NBA. I mean, it's kind of the same high that you just don't get from anything else. There's just nothing else like it. And you are giving that passion up the minute you speak up for yourself, which is, which is unfortunate. It shouldn't be that way. That was one of the things I think, too, that tugged at my heartstrings was just knowing what it's like in after retirement where you're trying to find your way of like, okay, what am I going to do to kind of tap into that passion? But even if I'm not doing the same exact thing and, you know, you see Lacey going through that of getting back to teaching dance for you little kids and, um, but, you know, that's a lot to try to work through, especially while you're going through a dragged out litigation process, (laughs) but it's definitely a lot. Yeah, so I don't at any time want to, you know, try to glorify like speaking up or blowing the whistle. It's it's a difficult path. But, you know, also listening to 
Kristen Ann Ware and, and stuff talking about her experience during the season, it's a difficult path either way. You know what I mean? It's like it's whether true. you choose to say something or you choose not to say something and really deal with any yeah. issues or emotion you had during that experience. But um, I tried to also in the film, I do have former Raiderettes alumni mm-hmm. speak up in the film as well, actually. And I just have to say that I have a lot of love for them. Like, I really had so much fun hanging out with them. They what were like... Was the event in the film that you were at? It was a fundraiser. Because um, one of the members, she is married to a former Raiders player or a f- former football player who has ALS. So it was a fundraiser for that. Um, and she was getting sort of recognition or award at this dinner event in Las Vegas. So they're like, oh, just come. Like we're all, uh, we as the former Raiders, we're all going to go and support her as she is getting this award. So it was just okay. really fun. They're just like, come hang out with us. And, you know, I interview people from like the 1960s when it was first starting to the, you know, 1990s, 2000s and, and so on. And I can, I can see in so many ways, like why they had this extreme fierce love for you know, their sisterhood and the Raiderettes and the family that they were able to form. And it's like decades long friendship. I think Lacey, you know, towards one of the later uh, days where I interviewed her almost at the end of the film, she was like, well, I guess if I didn't sue the team, if I didn't bring this up, I would, I would still have lifelong friends. You know, that's kind of the trade-off. That was the trade-off. Um and, you know, I think also like women, as you get older um, and you're working or you start families, you, you don't have like there's not really this kind of like social um, interaction that you used to have when you were in college or whatever before. And for women, it's like you also are really busy, if, especially if you have a family, because a lot of the caretaking work is put onto women, you know, so you're like really busy. You don't. Yeah, your social life is not quite the same. Yeah, your world, like, shrinks in many ways, right? So, anyways, I wanted to humanize and bring out the love and the passion, who, whatever side, you know, people were on. And that's another thing that I felt I didn't like about the media portrayal of the whole story was that it was just pitting women against women in so many ways. Like, you know, obviously in these articles, a reporter is going out there and, and contacting former cheerleaders being like, Oh, I need a, a quote from you. And, you know, like, do you support this? Yes or no. And it's kind of like a black and white thing, but it's not a black and white thing. It's a very nuanced thing that, you know, it's not being brought out. It's just saying like, this is one side, this is the other side. These are their opinions. And it's just rehashing that over and over again, but that doesn't advance the dialogue. That doesn't promote. Uh, understanding. And it, yeah. And I think that's part of the reason why um, even in starting the podcast, I know that I had been approached by reporters and you know, there's a lack of control of what sound bite they're going to pick up. You could say, um, half of the great things about your experience, half of like maybe the not so great things. And they're only going to take the soundbite that sounds good. That's probably going to be the things that you don't like. So I know that there was a, probably a a lot of distrust in the media and the way that they were portraying um, those lawsuits when they were happening, especially in 2018. And I love that you've gotten to see, obviously, just the balance of why the sisterhood is so strong, why people are so dedicated to this profession, regardless of how they may have been treated or paid in the past. I just think it's great to have that portrayed in a film where, I mean, I know you don't have footage of showing exactly what they love. And I thought it was amazing that you were able to get just that alumni perspective. I mean, I know when one of the alumni mentioned, like, it was almost like she said it, like, I feel so sorry for her because she, you know, she missed the boat of like what this is all about, you know, and this is about the friendships and the sisterhood. And, and I just remember thinking like, she shouldn't have had to miss out on that because I think if, this was really about sisterhood and everybody supporting one another. This would have been like the most opportune time to stand behind that one lone brave person who came forward to say that this isn't right. To me, that's what sisterhood is about. It's like having each other's back. And that sounds really easy to do it. You know, everybody's at different ages and points in their life, but you know, just kind of like, dug at me a little bit because it's just like she shouldn't have had to sacrifice kind of being that lone person out there on the island and everybody just being like well we have our sisters and we're doing fine and we love each other and we love it and just you know ostracized I just yeah I will never agree with 
that. I know it sounds judgy, but it's just something that's really hard because I just think that's not what community is about. That's not what sisterhood is really about. It's about standing up for other people. Maybe those who don't have a voice, you stand up for them. It's supporting those who speak up. And it's just tough because you're having to balance that with maybe not having an opportunity to dance anymore, which sucks ass. Excuse my French, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I think, I think too, though, I always try to think about not, uh, not necessarily judging, but putting all of the responsibility on women to change their behavior, mm-hmm. even in the context of this, even the context of, okay, you know, these alumni, whoever, the other teammates ostracize them, you know, friends who you thought were friends, stop talking to them. I try to have some compassion or empathy for that because it is about looking at the bigger picture as well. And the, the bigger picture of the power dynamics, mm-hmm. not just within the NFL, but you know, in our society in general. So, right. and, and sort of the centuries of conditioning that women have gone through and the internalizing of the misogyny that is so prevalent in almost, you know, all aspects of our lives. But at the same time, I think, yes, we need to talk about it. And that's why I feel like I'm so grateful that you are here and this podcast is here and, you know, you're creating a space as you said, for former cheerleaders, cheerleaders to have a voice, you know, for women to have a voice and talk about their experiences in the most nuanced, you know, ways. And it's not just about about like categorizing things, it's about digging into those sensitive issues and coming together. Yeah. And I think that's, if that's possible, I like really hope that is possible, you know, because without that, what do we have, right? Yeah, and that's what's so good about art, because whether it's film, music, dance, I mean, those things that kind of force you to think and talk about those things, that's what it's really all about. And I mean, I appreciate, maybe it's the filmmaker lens, but just finding a way to put all those different perspectives on display. And that's one of the things I know without people having the ability to see the film, but you captured so many different perspectives from the the women's attorneys to team management, whether it was the director of the Jills to the Jills, or not the Jills, the Bills president who made a quote in that film that I just had to write down because I was so pissed about it. But, (laughs) um, but, you know, you just got various perspectives. I mean, the NFL Players Association, executive director, I mean, lawmakers, like you really cover the gamut of just trying to get different perspectives on this issue. And like you said, that's really what it's about because it forces you to think about things a little differently. And with the podcast and, and thanks for the, for the love on that. I think we're, we're trying to, again, just create the safe space. And I know sometimes I go off on a, a, a tangent about different things because I get pretty passionate, but I think, like you said, maybe it's stepping back to understand that maybe the way that we are with one another isn't really so much of an issue of like, women supporting women, but just understanding the bigger picture and why we have that dynamic in the first place where we have to choose between right. doing something we love and standing up for our rights. That's a power dynamic that we didn't have any say so in. We're just forced to right. deal. With. And it's not the same, like the risk is different for everybody, right? I right. think, right. I mean, also if you look at Lacey and Maria, like they, Maria is a full-time accountant. Like she has a job that she can rely on to pay the bills. You know, Lacey's husband has a really, he had a really good job in San Francisco. So she was able to take this job that doesn't pay that much and their family wouldn't have to suffer. But, you know, like in the film, her she was talking to her grandma who she was a single mother and she was living in, you know, the South and she has no other way to support her family except for that one job so she didn't feel brave enough to report sexual harassment that was happening in her job where a guy was you know groping her by the copying machine so that's why I don't want to be like oh you did the right thing but you did the wrong thing like I think it's okay if you are too scared or you don't know what to do but the best thing is if you have that voice inside of you saying this is not right you know shouldn't be happening and you see someone else who is able to speak up and they do speak up you know you should support that person and maybe you can't support them publicly but you can still support them in other ways right Mm -hmm. um 
and I think in the film, like there's a scene towards the end with um, Maria. She finally reaches out to a few of her uh, former teammates because that was amazing that they agreed to it, that it happened. Like yeah. I was really moved by that moment. So that's a whole, that's a whole saga because that Jill's case is was is it's, it's, it's still ongoing. Going. Right? Yeah. It's so complicated, so multi layered. But one of the the storylines of that film was that you know when Maria and, and the other women, like I think there were five total that um, came together to file this lawsuit against the bills and also the contracted parties that were contracted out to manage the Jills, um, which includes the former director Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Um, basically two days later after they filed the lawsuit, Stephanie, who was a director and the bills essentially decided to not have the Jills anymore to cancel the whole team, even though auditions had taken place and there was a team that was selected. So all those women that tried out for the team who worked so hard, you know, were not able to actually have that experience. were not able to do the job because management decided to shut down the whole team. And in the media, that's a lot. That's a lot, lot, right? Specifically in the media, they framed it as the team was shut down because of the lawsuit filed by five former Jills. Literally, it made that correlation, making it seem like these women were responsible for shutting down the Jills. So it created a division in that community, like right away. Uh, and a very harsh one. Um, and so, you know, it was definitely, uh, you know, ostracization and she was not able to talk to people directly. She just heard, you know, rumors that people were bad mouthing her, saying things about her, but there was no direct communication. And, you know, as the lawsuit progressed, uh, finally, the New York courts decided to certify the class of women of former Jills, I think the total was like 140 something around there because it wasn't just her year of Jills, it was like a couple of years. Um, they, the course decided to certify them as a class. So the process began of like, okay, you know, sending out notices to all the class members saying, do you want to opt in to this lawsuit or do you want to not be part of this lawsuit? And during that time, um, some former captains sent around a text message. It was this kind of text message campaign saying, you know, if in doubt, opt out. It was, you know, urging the former Jills to opt out of the lawsuit. And it was literally spreading false information about the lawsuit saying, oh, if you opt out, that means the women who sued won't get as much money as they were going to get, as if they were going to get that much money in the first place, or if it was even about that. So that caused about 40 something percent of the class to opt out of the lawsuit, which is huge because normally the regular rate is like 1% or 3% of the class opts out of a class action lawsuit. So this is like historic numbers. So at that time, you know, it was a very tense time for the lawsuit for Maria, you know, what was going to happen. And it was like this renewed sense of like, people are against her, you know, it was like, she felt like she was the bad guy or the villain and these people were saying you know whatever you're a terrible person you're trying to do this terrible thing that's wrong even though her intention was to actually help these women and future women so I think she just reached out to a couple of women like via social media like that who were on her team like her year her line or whatever and you know wanted to ask them about it and and one of them like responded and then um she contacted this other woman who also then responded uh, one of them wanted to be anonymous, um, but there were two that, you know, agreed to show their face on camera and, and so on. And, you know, one of them, she, Maria has known since elementary school, but they hadn't talked because of because this of litigation. Yeah. So, yeah, it was like, you know, she was very nervous during that time. And I remember I, remember I really wanted to capture this moment because I knew it was really important, not just for the film, but for her as well, that it's, it's the, like one of the first times that she was able to talk to these other women, uh, you know, about what was going on. And to me, the thing that really moved me was when one of the former Jills was saying, like, when she got this text from the former captains, it made her feel like 
you know, really confused because she felt like, oh, well, you know, the lawsuit, they're saying like it would take away Stephanie, the former director, like her house maybe, or, you know, she has, Stephanie has a daughter, like, and then what would happen to her daughter, her family? Like it felt like by opting into the lawsuit that she was hurting people. Got it. Yeah, I and that. I think, yeah, I think that that also is just so indicative of like how women think in general and how we, you know, think about others. And that's why so many people say like women are often the glued to a community because, you know, we are thinking about other people, how our actions impact other that's people. Perfect. And there's this onus on us to do the right thing, to hold, to carry like the emotional labor. I think that's another you know, term that people talk about right now, it's a very real thing that, you know, we have to do. And you can see this woman, this former Joe struggling with that decision, you know, but it shouldn't be about that because it's like the lawsuit is about doing what's right for yourself and for others. It's actually, it's something that you should not feel guilt over. It's something that, you know, is, it's a good thing. And I think it was just clouded with all of this the surrounding yeah exactly it's not like maria would have had the ability to <laughs> like none of this is i'm sure like planned and mapped out from a pr perspective or at least just you know pr for your own team to you know share information and just say this is what it's all about this is how it works this is how class like there's no probably room for any of that where you can have any opportunity to present your side of the story, the facts, you know, the information that you're getting from your lawyer to help frame up what this looks like. Because litigation scary and there's so many freaking steps yeah. and battles and yes. different issues that you're fighting about at any given time. I mean, my former lawyer life, I can understand it. Um, I stayed away from litigation on purpose, but there's a lot that is confusing about it. And yes. just obviously she wasn't in a position to dispel a lot of the myths about it. Like by the time people are setting up group texts and sh- sharing information back and forth, you're not even a part of and privy to, there's yeah. no room for you to interject, to defend yourself, to share some facts or your perspective. I think that's why I was so moved that there were actually was a moment where there was a conversation because I know that there really was just no space for that at the time that it was all going on, which is yeah. just sad. You check me, we if I'm talking <laughs> you judgy. But you know, there's so many factors, right? There's age, there's just yeah. how you feel about this one opportunity to dance and you that you've been working your butt off. This is a, your rookie season and you're just pissed because the team's taken away. And you know, and maybe you just aren't in a space where you are able to take a step back and think for yourself, you know, like to do yeah. your own research, to Um, not everybody's got some personal lawyer that they can reach out to to say like, hey, do you think I should join this class action? And this is what I, like, there's just- I actually like the lawyer, Maria's lawyers and the other uh, Jill's who sued their lawyer actually put out this public notice basically saying like anyone who has questions can just call me in the office directly. <laughs> and, you know, here's this, the information, like he, they put out a press statement or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, but it's still, it's, you know, you can see how people would be hesitant to even make that call because it then it's like, oh, what if someone hears that you called their lawyer and then they spread some rumor about you? Like, oh, yeah. you know, this so-and-so did this. Did you know that? And then you're suddenly in a weird position. Right. And then you probably don't know. Like, I mean, I can imagine, I mean, we're talk we were just talking about teams being taken away and then who yeah. really sneaking them back in. You don't even know if people were trying to tread lightly just because in they're case. hoping, yeah. just in case, that the team yeah. comes back that they want exactly. to take some kind of good graces so that they still have an opportunity to dance. There's so many factors that go yeah, in. Yeah, and, and it's like, and obviously people engage in, sorry, in like favoritism and rewarding the, the loyalty, like, oh, okay, you remain loyal. Like, I'm going to reward you. You're going to f- toe the line. You're going to do exactly as I say. Like, that is the culture, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you tell me, I don't know. No, you're so right. It it's like, like you get on board with the program and drink the Kool-Aid or, you know, shut up and dance or you know there's just there's limited space to have a differing opinion put it that way when you are trying to balance that with an opportunity to do what you love for those you know however many months of the year I mean it's such a small tight window and I get that there's a lot at stake there's a lot at stake and I mean who am I to judge you know what goes into that but it's just amazing and fascinating to see if people don't take a step back to try to think critically about something or 
or empathize to put themselves in the shoes of the woman that, I mean, I, for, this makes me think of like both Chris Dan's story and I think one of the Texans cheerleaders, but for the most part, people are witnesses to what's going on. Either they're a victim themselves, they're kind of going right. through it, and they're, you know, they're also not getting paid or they saw somebody get duct taped or, you know, it's not that hard to put yourself in another person's shoes because you're living it too in some way, whether it actually yeah. happens to you or not. But, and maybe it's a maturity thing, but it's like trying to think for yourself and I, in a, yeah. especially in a world of misinformation. And that applies generally speaking outside yeah. of this, this world. Like that's today with coronavirus rumors, every, you know, every time you turn around, I mean, you have to kind of take a step back, process information, try to do your own research, think for yourself, what makes sense for you? Should you send your, you know what I mean? Like you have to yeah. kind of think through so that you come to a rational decision um, that's not so much driven by fear. Yeah, I think that's the key thing. And I think that's, you know, but when you're like, you're immersed in this world or culture of fear, it's hard to extricate yourself from that, right? And Christian also mentioned, like, you know, there's a point where you kind of stop listening to yourself, you shut out your own intuition about things. And, you know, I think that's the key is to really try to touch with that. And I think, you know, Maria and Lacey, both of them, they told me over and over again, the reason why they were able to go through with everything and to keep going through the four years of you know me following them is like they knew they were doing the right thing that knowledge that you was know persisted was. yeah that they that knowledge of that they were doing the right thing persisted and they tapped into that and they kept telling themselves that and I think everybody has that voice inside them to an extent telling you what is right for you what is wrong for you you know know what where you should draw a line you know where you should be more open and I think you kind of you just need to like listen to that voice because more often than not that is going to be the right thing for you yeah totally totally agree and I think in this space especially you know and there's parallels obviously with broader society but it's just finding your way and that touches on so many things from how you feel about your body and your looks to how you're treated, your voice is speaking to you in the, each situation that you might experience and is trying to guide you. And I just think mm. it's tuning into that voice, like you said, and just kind of honoring that voice. That voice for me is like, that will make me quit a job, even without a job. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done that in my career before because that voice is so strong where I can't even ignore it, you know? And, yeah. But that's just part of, you know, I won't say it's a woman thing, but I just think we have such a strong sense of intuition and we're so in tune with others and, you know, but we also have to be, what's the word I'm looking for? I think sometimes our compassion for other people can trump how we feel about ourselves and wanting to kind of look out for ourselves in that way. And the women were just super strong in the film to have that be their guiding force through it all to come back to, to kind of reinforce and like, no, you're doing the right thing. That says a lot that they were able to have that ground them. Yeah. And I also think I tried to, in small ways in the film, show that even though in a lot of the film, they're very alone, like Lacey and Maria never meet each other in the film. And in a way, Lacey starts off the film because she was the first woman to speak up. And then Maria's story with, and the Jill's lawsuit rounds out the film because there are so many things that happened with that lawsuit. So I wanted to create the sense of like, you know, passing on the baton mm -hmm. and sort of towards the end of the film, when we finally hit 2018, you know, after the Me Too movement and like all these other women join in, like Bailey Davis, Kristen Nowhere, like the Texans, you know, other cheerleaders speaking up and speaking out, even though they, again, they don't actually meet each other. I want to create the sense of like, you're not alone. There's other women out there that have experienced similar things and are trying to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I really appreciate this podcast again, because it's kind of like a, a continuation of that legacy, you know, the ripple effect of their actions. Okay. It was really great experience to have um, both Lacey and Maria come to the premiere in New York and meet each other for the first time. Thanks. And Maria was like six months pregnant and she was afraid of flying. So she had her mother-in-law drive her down to New York City from Buffalo. Oh. <laughs> really scary for both of them. And they're both like, oh, we're like country girls. We don't know what to do in New York City. It's like so daunting. But it was so cool to see them meet each other and 
watched the film together, you know, with family and friends and all of us and the crew. And they st- stood up in front of people at the q and It was like a sold out show. And people were asking them questions and people literally were thanking them. People were like, thank you. I mean, these were not anybody who was a cheerleader or worked in the, you know, cheerleading dance or whatever, just random audience are like, thank you for what you did. And then I feel like they just felt the sense of like, you know, coming full circle in a way of, of being able to have perspective on all the things that they did during these years and the path that they've walked, you know, so far. And there was a sense of pride that they took from that. And I think that was special, even though the Jill's lawsuit, you know, is still ongoing, you know, even though the reality of the, you know, world of NFL cheerleading hasn't necessarily changed that much, they can still have pride in what they did. Yeah. And the lives and that the, they did affect. Frankly, what these women have accomplished has put a big fat spotlight on how these teams were run, how they were managed, how they were paid. And, you know, it may still not be a perfect world. No world is, but it's better trust from the journey that they walked. There's no more cheating the system in terms of trying to label <coughs> pro leaders and dancers as independent contractors, which means you don't have to pay them hourly wages. Everything that was going wrong in terms of pay and probably the scrutiny around some of these rules, that's all improved, I would say, dramatically in the last couple of years, thanks to the women that have come forward. And I love that they were able to meet and understand that there is a broader community outside of NFL cheerleaders that support them and understand what they were fighting for. You know, you've been all over the world, frankly, right, and promoting the film at different film festivals. And... I think it dawned on me, um, I don't remember where this school is located that did a play that was kind of- Oh yeah, Carthage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it just kind of hit me that like this group of women that have come forward with these lawsuits, um, they're finding each other, they're meeting each other for the first time, they're coming together for these panels and and it's great to see, but I was kind of struck by like, wow, does our own community, you know, maybe the pro Trilogy podcast community of listeners, like, do we know who these women are? are they really like, you know, on the outside of this circle? And I don't want to believe that that is the case. And even to the extent that it was the case during the litigation, you know, in the heat of the moment, everybody was, you know, in their feelings and afraid and scared and not knowing what to do. But now maybe because there has been some time away from it, maybe because there is a little bit of a platform to share their stories. I just want to make sure that they are embraced And I just think your film helps educate people about the issues, again, from so many different perspectives, and also just helps them feel like they're connected to a larger community, if that makes any sense. So, I mean, I just really want to thank you because they probably did go through a lot of it alone. And now that the the film is out and they're able to connect with others that have gone through similar battles, because I think your film has been featured with other films that are around similar issues right social justice issues is that yeah yeah for sure it's been programmed um a lot with like other films about women um women fighting for their rights women dealing with sexual harassment you know running the gamut of the women's experience you know which I think is so important because like you mentioned like I wanted to make this film and connect these dots in a way of you know what is going on in our world today in terms of the women's movement and Mm -hmm. that this battle that these women are fighting in and in many many ways that they felt like they were so alone in fighting that it's connected to a larger battle right and I think I've heard so many women pro cheerleaders talk about the part of the reason why they love their job is because they felt like they were connected to something bigger than themselves, that they were serving something bigger than themselves, especially Maria, because she, what she loved about the job was doing community events and going out and doing appearances and meeting the little kids who looked up to her. Um, and even Lacey, too, she always wanted to be a role model for younger girls. And that was like one of the things that really satisfied them in their lives. And I think now, you know, with the film, like Lacey was like, you know, this is another way that I can feel like I'm a part of something bigger than myself and that I'm making a difference for young girls and women, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's another aspect of sisterhood that could be 
very rewarding and very meaningful is that, you know, you're coming together to make positive change, right? You're not just coming together to affirm the status quo or to, you know, affirm your loyalty to something. You're coming together to make positive change. And I think that's, that can be very powerful. Absolutely. And I just think that, gosh, the minute that light just like clicks in everybody where they kind of see the power that we have in numbers. I know it was something that you uh, touched on in your film that the Buffalo Jills were actually the only team that formed a union for a short period of time. Yeah, in 1995. Yeah. And unfortunately, just based on dissension and people who were wanting to hold out to kind of negotiate and um, go through these issues and um, deal with them on a broader level was kind of counteracted with people who just wanted to dance and didn't want to lose out on that opportunity. So the union kind of fell apart. But you see the efforts, right, of women trying to come together and make a difference. And I I was just even thinking about, like, this is Women's History Month right now, right? And I'm just thinking, looking back on history, like, women weren't even allowed to own property till like, the middle of the 1800s you know the 19th amendment wasn't passed until 1919 like women weren't even allowed to vote and it was only a segment it was like just white women or something like all other ethnicities were excluded so it's like you know and then 1960s that's when you had the second wave feminism and you had the equal pay act but it's like you see these spurts of activity of women coming together making change and, and achieving some things Right. But then there would be like a gap or something of like darkness and there'd be like nothing happened. And there's no like there's not this sense of continued movement. And I, I just really would love to see that, you know, that we should understand our history. We should understand how far we've come and mm-hmm. you know, acknowledge all the work that women have have done before us. And that's why I want to include that seeing the nineteen ninety five Buffalo Joe's cheerleaders that did come together to form a union because Buffalo also it's a rust belt town I mean it's like a union town it has a very strong tradition of that but it also has a strong tradition about like work stereotypes right gender stereotypes when it comes to work like the real work of men is real work um and you know that's women's work you know like oh I'm working in the fact in the steel factory like whatever and then you're just taking care of kids like so it's kind of this interesting combination of all these different opposing factors and these women stood up and said no and like I read an article about that lawsuit back in 95 and it was like exactly the same language people were like this is not a job you're just dancing on the sidelines titillating men and that's exactly you know the same attitude yeah these articles just last year and the year before yeah And like we interviewed fans, you know, like there's a scene in the film where we interviewed Buffalo fans and this woman was like, that's actually one of my favorite scenes where this woman was like, well, I don't agree with the image that these women are portraying in terms of being so skinny and sexy, whatever, and how, what that says to younger women and like this male fan being like, oh, they're just, you know, dancing for drunk guys at games. Like, I don't care about them. And then his friend is like, well, you're every game. You're that drunk guy who's like enjoying it. Right. So it's this like ingrained, deeply, deeply ingrained stereotypes against women and sort of the need to categorize and put women in these categories of good and bad to judge them. And in some ways, it's kind of like you're only able to enjoy women's beauty or, you know, uh, skills, talent, if somehow you also at the same time look down on it and devalue it. Somehow those things have to go hand in hand, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, that, and it's like, why? <laughs> so I don't even know how I got onto this tangent. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm tangent central. I mean, you're bringing up different points in the movie, but I have to mention because I, I was so mad, but uh, Russ Brendan, you know, the bill's president and CEO said something to the effect that his given F meter was zero yes. and couldn't care less whether the Jills existed. Like he actually, I'm sure this came out maybe in discovery or something. And I don't know if that was an email or how that oh. Yeah, so the Jill's case, that's it went into depositions, right? Mm-hmm. And this is the first case. It's the first case that went into depositions because that went that far. Didn't, yeah, they didn't do that. Um, and it was like days upon days upon days of depositions. So I read like thousands of pages of these oh depositions, which was 
kind of crazy. But again, it's so fascinating because all of this is available for the public. Like oh, yeah. if anyone wants, they can go to the Erie County like courthouse website and l- download these depositions and read them. And yeah, yeah he says like the uh, Russ Brandon who has now been, who has now resigned quote unquote, you know, because of sexual, <laughs> possible oh, sexual right. misconduct, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of Bill's organization um he says yeah he says that he couldn't care less if they existed he said they were inconsequential from a business perspective and yet he admitted that they're a part of the game day experience right which is totally contradictory if, how can you say that they're part of the game day experience and say that they're inconsequential from a business standpoint you know and that's why like and this was probably in like you know the bitch better have my money episode or maybe we didn't even really like drill down on it but i just i just really really want people to understand and know their worth in this arena like in the pro cheerleading pro dance for professional sports teams arena especially right whether that's semi pro whether that's pro like regardless when you are a brand ambassador that word gets thrown around so much yeah but you are building a billion dollar business brand by standing out there in the cold, interacting with the community, going to all these events and charity events, fundraisers, like you are doing work that has maybe an intangible dollar sign associated with it, but don't ever be fooled in thinking that all you're doing is dancing, that you really don't have, I guess, this monetary worth associated with it. And I don't know if maybe that's why there was such a struggle with oh, well, I would do it for free. You know, like I'm, yeah. I really want to dance and I don't really need a dollar. I just don't want people to think that there's not a huge worth that you bring to the table for these teams. Like, don't get it. Yeah. You know, there's XFL that's happening without cheerleaders. I mean, yes, a game can, of any professional sport can exist without dancers and cheerleaders, duh. But there's an added value that we bring in being an extension of that brand in their communities because, that's how their trademarks, I mean, here I am on my little tangent, but when you think about a brand name like Apple, that brand is worth however much it's worth, think a kajillion, right? Because of how people feel connected to that brand and what they associate that brand to mean. And so every time that you are stepping in a uniform, representing that brand, wearing that logo and creating goodwill, I mean, that's the value. You're of adding to it. You're adding to yeah. it. You're making that stock of that brand go up and up and up every single positive interaction that you have every smile you put on somebody's face and so I just think when I saw that particular moment in the film with this guy basically saying like he didn't give an f and that they really had no value whatsoever it just made me want to scream at the top of my lungs and this is where the debate what you'll see online too a lot of people say that there's just nobody cares nobody needs them what they do is not important and they're here to watch the guys and that's it and it's just all of that aside, like those are just opinions and it just, again, it doesn't really change the fact that if a team has cheerleaders and you're creating all these rules and expectations for this role, this job that you shouldn't that pay. Totally doesn't matter. And you should also be thinking like if it, what is fair, what is fair pay? Like, is it fair that you're getting the same amount as the people selling beers and hot dogs that mm-hmm. requires no training to do those jobs or the parking attendant like yeah like those, all those people are part of the game day too but the moment I feel like anyone starts training as an athlete as a dancer as a cheerleader you know who invests time throughout their life from the age of five mm-hmm. you know six mm-hmm. whatever age you're beginning to accrue value for yourself mm-hmm. and once you get into that professional space that is when your value as a professional needs to be recognized. Exactly. I, I think also people don't understand, uh, for example, Mike, this guy, Michael Lombardi, who was a football exec and he's now a commentator. The main thing he was saying, you know, the NFL football, it's, it's a business that almost at this point can't fail. You know, it's just growing and growing. Like viewership went up by 5% last season. The value of this league of the game is entertainment. Right. He was saying, like, you, you shouldn't really think of athletes just as, as athletes and, and football players just as athletes. They're actually entertainers. And the value that they're paid is directly correlated to how much people want to be entertained by them. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like people often be like, oh, why are they paid $30 million or whatever? Because they have value to people. Right. right. Like the value that you have should be attached, should be clear because 
you're part of the entertainment industry. And people, people always say like in Lacey's Raiderette handbook, it says like football is the name of the game. You know, you're a cheerleader. We don't need cheerleaders. But yeah, okay, football is the name of the game, but it's also about entertainment. And as a cheerleader, that's your job is to entertain the crowd, is to, you know, promote that brand and to interact with the fans and the community. Like that is value, you know? And I think that even in in terms of the CBA negotiations right now with the football players, like Aaron Rodgers, Mm -hmm. we put out a statement saying like, we as the players need to know our worth. We need to understand our worth. And that is how we're going to actually, yeah, in essence, win against, you know, the, the multi-billionaire owners. Right. And part of knowing your worth is seeing the bigger picture, like Mm -hmm. seeing how your work is, involved in this giant system this giant industry of football like this multi-billion dollar industry and it's not a shame to say like i need to be valued more it's not shameful it's not hurtful to other people exactly. this is a statement of fact. fact thank you and to you know take it even that step further we all have a job of some sort right and you know if i'm looking at my job for my company I'm not going to say, oh, my job doesn't matter because they make so much more money and I'm just this peon that does X, Y, and Z. I am going to hold my own about what I contribute to that bigger picture. I'm not going to blow it up out of proportion and say that I'm the reason the company exists and I should be the center of all things, but I'm definitely going to say that in my role doing X, I bring value to the table. I show up, I do my job, I do it well, and I deserve to be paid. And if I've performed well, I'm probably, I'm going to deserve a raise. And so that mindset also applies to our world of dance and professional cheer. And I think, yay, we got to maybe some like ground zero baseline of like, hey, you actually have to pay them at least minimum wage. But there's definitely something that we can take from the football players that are going through it in their own right, you know, yes, they're the numbers yeah. that they're working from are a lot higher, but, but they fought hard to get there. Th- yes, they absolutely did. And it's a continuous struggle because their owners are continually making a sh- crap ton off of them. And the fact that all players aren't compensated on that same level that maybe a quarterback would. Yeah, no. But, you know, my eyes stay on the prize of imagining a world where professional cheerleaders and dancers can have a salary that would be recognized similar to where we stand right now with the mascots, because you can't yeah. tell for two seconds that the freaking mascot who wears a god dang suit the whole entire time, <laughs> interacting with fans and going to different events, maybe they do a little dance, but what is so different about the entertainment factor that they bring that is completely intangible because you have a, a bird or a duck or whatever <laughs> interacting with humans. A pirate. It, a pi- you know what I mean? So yeah. you're going to attribute $60,000 of salary to this role, but yeah. you can't appreciate what a real life human can do to interact with a child and have a meaningful conversation about bullying at a school assembly to dancing their behind off at different performances. You can't tell me that we can't move that needle, you guys, to something that's actually meaningful. Maybe it's not 60,000, but maybe we can get to like, I don't know, 30,000. Can we get to something that really establishes that we are worth so much more than where we're currently paid? I would be a happy camper. I really would be a happy camper because we have to know that we're worth that. We have to know that the time and energy that we're putting into it is worth it. We have to know that a squad of like 28 to 30 something to 40 people is still, even if you add that all up, it's not, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what's earned by these teams. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, but I just feel so passionate about it. I think one last, I, one example I just want to talk about too is uh, the Dallas Cowboys. I think when people are, you know, don't know much about football at all, when you say Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, immediately people recognize that they're almost like a brand onto themselves, oh, right? Okay. And and the, the Cowboys, when's the last time that they won a Super Bowl? Like the '90s or something? When's the last time they've had you know a fabulous season? I I'm not sure, you know. And yet they're the most valuable sports franchise in the world, not just in the NFL. In the you world. know, in the world. 
And so if you're saying, if you're someone to say, oh, well, you know, it's about football. It's about, you know, winning football. Well, that's not, that doesn't necessarily equal value, right? The value of your franchise is about marketing. And, yeah. you know, the, again, the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders, that's their job. And, you know, like Erica Wilkins, who sued the team, she said she was paid like $5,000 the first year that she cheered and, you know, 16000 in the third year that she cheered, but she wasn't paid for all the hours. And then after her lawsuit settled, they gave them a raise from $8 to $12 an hour and from 200 to $400 per game, right? So again, like that, how much money? $12 an hour for the most valuable sports franchise in, in the world? And that's why you have these iconic women that dance for you, I was watching a show about um, F1 on Netflix the other day, and they had the uh, race in Austin, and they had the Cowboys cheerleaders there, and they showed them there, you know, like they were doing an appearance or something, and it's like, you know, you have the cheerleaders at this F1 event, like clearly mm-hmm. they're a recognizable icon, and that has value. <laughs> Absolutely does. And then when you think of like the shifts that the teams have made in reaction to these lawsuits, where yes, we all benefit and maybe it's from eight to $12 an hour or, you know, a little bit more, but just imagine that that pot is a lot bigger in terms of, or that piece of the pie that they sliced off to make it a little bit better for us. It's still very, very low compared to where we really should be setting the bar of what we're worth. And that takes obviously a whole lot, right? It takes a whole lot of coordination yes, and yes. support for us all to unanimously say we're worth more than that. You know, we're going through auditions and yes. everybody wants their opportunity to dance. You know, if a few people say, you know, we're not going to do it, we're going to stand up and say, we deserve yeah. more. There's 30, 40, 50 people behind you that'll be like, move out the way, girl. I'm about to go for mine. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. it's, it's unfortunate, but I just think, you know, I'm just still going to keep putting it out there till I'm blue in the face and I cannot wait to have a conversation about unionization on this podcast, just so people understand that if we actually can kind of free our minds to move in a direction of declaring our worth and holding firm to that, the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. I feel like your film definitely opens up the broader picture. And for that, I mean, I just couldn't be more grateful because I think, you know, with any negative news or anything that people want to associate negativity to, people tend to tune out, right? Like they don't want to listen probably don't want to read the articles because they know what they're going to say. But I just think for people who will get the opportunity to see your film, they're going to just have a whole different perspective on what these lawsuits have really been about, what it really took to bring them and go through the whole litigation process. There's no mystery as to why the Buffalo Bills litigation is still being dragged out. They really don't have much of a case other than to drag their behinds throughout the process, keep lowballing them with every settlement conversation that they have. Yep. Because they're in the wrong. Like the further this yeah. goes along, I mean, they have no case to really support, to defend. I feel like and the only thing that they really can do is throw money towards stalling this out to wear them down, to accept whatever settlement offer that's on the table. And I just hope they stay firm, but it's so much goes into the fighting. And I think you displayed it in such a wonderful way. I mean, for the women that got to share their lives with someone who understood their world or willing to learn about their world and like you said earlier, just not presented in a uh, headline grabbing or even, you know, sometimes people even try to make sure they sound stupid or paint them in certain lights in the way that they portray them. And I just think you yeah. did everyone a wonderful, respectful, not service, but you know what I mean? You just really Thank did a really great yeah. job in the way that you portrayed the women. Yeah, I, I think for me, I really, one thing I really like about the film is like Lacey and Maria are so different in terms of their yeah. personalities. And that in itself kind of defies a stereotype of what of cheerleaders grouped together as this one homogenous group. Yeah. You know, like Lacey is very outgoing, she's outspoken, but Maria is very, she's very shy and very soft spoken, mm-hmm. right? And it's like you have the, that, gamut you know in there and like everybody is different so I think that in itself was something interesting and also I think through the process of making this film showing cuts to our funders and things like that some of the feedback we would get would be like oh well why can't this film feel more like you know like a story about a, a male football player who was really poor and then he made it as an NFL football player and then he, you know, did it for his family and everybody was so happy, like whatever, this kind of heroic glory kind of narrative. And I'm like, 
because women's lives are different, you know? Like, I think people don't really understand that. Another thing is they're like, oh, why can't there be one clear antagonist in your film? You know, just make it about the lawsuit. This is a simple story. But for me and my team, like, we knew from the beginning that this is not a simple story because women's lives is not just, you know, if we defeat this one thing, then, oh, we're going to have equality or we're suddenly going to have all the rights and all these things. It's like a multifaceted thing that every woman is dealing with on a day-to-day basis, you know, yeah. and that, that's why it's important. Ripple effects. It's super complex. So, yeah, and that's why it's important to show Lacey, like, with her kids and trying to get her husband to watch her kids as she's trying to go and teach a dance class, like these arguments that, you know, an argument they would have or whatever the moments where Maria's like cleaning her house and like making dinner after she got lowballed at the mediation or like her relationship with her mom, like all of these things, you know, it's all of the work that we do in our lives and all the different struggles that we have in many ways that go unseen, right? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to like, to show that and to, you know, bring that out. And hopefully people can understand a little bit more, you know, about like, all the things that we deal with. Absolutely. No, you did a great, great job of that. And you, you touched on probably one of my last questions I guess is just in terms of responses to the film since you've been touring all over for film festivals um, and having Q&A with the public after is there a general consensus other than they love the film like are there critical questions that are asked or responses that you find surprising or frustrating or anything like that that you want to speak to? So we, I've been touring with the film for, um, you know, almost a year now since its premiere. And we've been all over everywhere. Like, you know, we've been to over 15, 20 film festivals and connecting with audiences. And that's definitely another part of the job that I really love. Some, sometimes you I definitely come across people who are still dismissive or skeptical of because you know and that's kind of this the dismissiveness and skepticism i've faced since the beginning i'm trying to get this film made people will just make comments like oh well it doesn't matter that they get paid or not they can just go on and pose for sports illustrated uh or whatever or pose for playboy like who cares well i would never allow my daughter to be a cheerleader just all of these things that I felt like I was just affected in terms of my mental health. Like, why? Like, why? It's kind of like so unjust. Like, why is everyone piling all this judgment? On cheerleaders. Exactly. And what we do to doing, <laughs> they didn't choose to fucking, like, I'm sorry now, but like, they didn't okay. choose to be revealing in their clothes. Like, the team designs a freaking uniform. So that's the point. We don't have a seat at the table to have a conversation about what would be fair what would be right what they'd be comfortable with but at the same time I feel like I've been so like encouraged because of the conversations I've had as a result of some of these reactions and like I love it literally it's something I love to hear when someone starts off being like I don't know and then at the end of it they're like oh wait yeah wait I do see that wait that is no why oh why did I think that like You know, I think that has been so rewarding, Mm. you know, and, you know, I think that kind of difference is just encouraging that people can actually have different opinions, but then through conversation, through, you know, a connection, actually understand things and have like to grow in their perception. (laughs) A well-informed perspective. You can have your opinion, but at least be open-minded enough to consider other perspectives and maybe it shapes and helps form or fine tune your opinion or change your opinion. That's the beauty of seeing that evolution where somebody can start from a very fixed closed-minded space and then from exposure and a little bit of education and different perspectives, then they can kind of, I would thrive in those moments as well, if I were. <laughs> <laughs> especially um, in a Q and A setting where people have just watched your film and great for the women that are able to come out and be a part of those Q&A sessions. I was really just curious, like, what the public response has been. I think, yeah, I think a lot of the time people are still shocked when yeah. they hear about 
you know, what the pay structure was, how they were treated. I think, I think people are still shocked, even with all the press that happened after the lawsuits came out. And, you know, in 2018, like New York Times doing all of those mm-hmm. articles, I think, yeah, it's still something that people can't believe, you know, is happening so recently, you know, some of these lawsuits are still not resolved. So I think that is also encouraging in the sense of like, you know, it's another thing that forces people to question the current state of things. You know, yeah. how is it possible that this is something that still can happen in our world, you know? Was there anything that you felt that you learned or grew from shooting this film? I think so much. I mean, I feel like I became an adult <laughs> through making this film. <laughs> Not to say that I wasn't an adult before, but I just feel like... I have grown so much because uh, so I started this film March of 2014 and that was you know just the beginning and in that year I got married in 2014 um, in over the summer Mm -hmm. Um, just all these changes in my life I finished my first feature documentary in 2017 and and went around with that the one that was about jeopardy um and then (laughs) uh and then i finished this film in 2019 and worked with you know collaborated with all these different people and the ups and downs of like trying to get funding um speak about the film i think just to be honest i was a very shy child like i'm i'm an only child i was very i'm still very introverted as a filmmaker, like, I realize you really just need to be clear and be confident about what is the story you're trying to tell, why you want to tell it, like, why do you want to be passionate about it, you know, and I think that that was just, like, tested time and time again of having to talk to people about the film, having to explain to other people what I was thinking, what I was feeling, because mm-hmm. sometimes, I mean, that's still, like, a uh, work in progress, like, I still need to work on that in, in many ways, but I think it's just like tr- learning to trust myself mm. to in the face of all these questions and criticisms, you know, like, why are you the person to make this film? You're not even American. You didn't know what football was like. I feel like the biggest thing was like people were like saying, who cares? You yeah. know, like and that's you're having to explain and make and, them understand yeah. why and, it's important. And it's like they're saying like this story doesn't deserve to be told. Like that's not maybe what they're saying directly, but that's what they're implying. And having to confront that, overcome that, and then just trust myself, trust my team, trust the women in the film and their power, you know, I think that was a learning process and that took a really long time and it, it was difficult. But I'm so glad that you know I went through all of that I mean I am too I mean I'm like I said just been so excited um, from the minute that we kind of connected over social media like right after we started the podcast and I'm just super excited for you and the film success and just the story that's out there and can't wait till it's going to be just more widely (laughs) disseminated so that everybody can get a chance to watch the film how can people and when can people see the film Yeah, so the film is a co-production with ITVS, which is this independent branch of PBS. And so the film will be on PBS toward the end of this year. We don't quite know what the air date is, but we are in the middle right now of trying to figure that out. And it's going to be on a series called Independent Lens, which is, you know, a national primetime documentary series on PBS. It's really well regarded. So I'm super uh-huh. happy oh my gosh, going to be on it. And, you know, everybody can watch PBS. Like maybe you don't have cable or whatever, but you don't need cable. You can just watch PBS and it's going to be on, it's going to be streaming right after the TV broadcast for free online. So anyone can watch it. And then we're trying to also secure digital distribution in terms of, you know, getting it on streaming platforms like Amazon and and things like that. So eventually it will get out there. And I'm really excited that it's going to have this broadcast 
in the middle of or toward the end of football season and, Mm -hmm. you know, have people watch it. We're trying to also do like community screenings and screenings at schools and colleges and and things like that and get in touch with like dance programs or cheer programs in different colleges to, again, because I, what I really want is for dancers and cheerleaders young women to like watch this film you know and have a conversation about it and connected to this larger conversation that is happening right now and but I think the best thing to do is to follow our social media which is a woman's work doc on all the different social media Instagram Facebook Twitter um we have our website too so people can like we post all our updates and like where we're going to be screening and it's been encouraging too like you know especially through our instagram where we've gotten dms from dancers uh, or cheerleaders who are saying like when is this going to come to my city like literally someone messaged us and was like i just joined a pro team and i'm experiencing some terrible things like i heard about your film when can i watch your film (laughs) i'm like oh my god it's coming <laughs> like it's coming that's out because so. i think it is a story that's worth telling a lot of people are going to experience an encounter a lot that's covered in the film in some form or fashion and even with the podcast they're probably going to experience some things that have been touched on in various episodes and there is a community and and resources and information and people who are rooting for you to have the best experience possible which would be being paid being valued and being treated well while you're doing what you love. And I just really salute you, seriously. This is, I will send everybody your way, obviously with all the links to everything and sharing the updates for you of where your film will be if you're continuing to tour. I mean, I don't know if things will slow down with stupid coronavirus or what, but I know I was super pumped about you coming to Seattle and I can't wait for that to get rescheduled. Exactly. You know, we end every episode with, either locker talk which is like a funny story about something that you experienced maybe you have bloopers from your filming I don't know or we can get to know you a little bit better with nice and light and fluffy fun questions that you can answer and drop it like it's hot so oh sure I mean this is I don't know if this is funny because it's I feel like every story I have that I think is funny is also sad though at the same time (laughs) so (laughs) like people people you know ask me like oh you know why are you making this film like were you a dancer before or whatever and I would you know I recall my experience from childhood where in elementary school you know it was like me and like four other friends and you know we had like a variety show and we tried to make up a dance or we made up a dance to perform at this this variety show whatever but unfortunately my group of friends you know they were what you would call mean girls and they were bullying bullying me and they told me like oh you're too ugly you can't dance very well so we're gonna dance in a line in front of you you have to dance behind us so no one can see you no. so literally- <laughs> no yeah so that's what happened so I was like dancing by myself like behind these three other girls like on stage and it was just a very sad experience and then you know my mom would also be like throughout you know, a child would be like, you're not very coordinated. Like my mom used to dance. She used to be, she's a multi-talented woman, whatever, but she would be like, you're not very coordinated. But, you know, then I took some dance classes. Like I took a hip hop class. Like um, I took some Zumba classes and then I felt like I gained some confidence in myself. Like I really like dancing, you know, even if it's just like at a club or something or anywhere, like I love dancing. And I feel like also, in filming with Crystal Cruz, one of the um, cheerleaders that sued the New York Jets, right. she, yeah. she did a, a dance, graduate dance program at Hunter College in New York, and I got to go and, like, film some of her classes and witness it. Like, there's dancers of all shapes and sizes there, which I didn't really realize. I thought, like, you had to have that, like, athletic body you had to be like super thin but some of these other dancers you know they were so beautiful and graceful in their own right and I'm like oh I just felt like so happy after yeah. <laughs> after knowing that because it's something that is so enjoyable like anybody and everybody would love to move their body to music like that's such a basic thing <laughs> yeah and it's for everybody that's been something that I would say especially as you know our industry continues to evolve just seeing people of all different, whether it's gender, body type, whatever, just killing it and just having that joy of moving your body, like you said, to dance and just the joy that it brings. And you literally 
light up watching yeah. and then you light up from yeah. actually doing it dance is for everyone yeah and like you know when you see Lacey like te- te- teaching like little kids you know she goes yeah. from you know pro cheerleaders in the NFL you're dancing in front of 70,000 fans or whatever and she's like teaching like four kids at the yeah. local yeah. Like, YMCA but you see how much she loves it like there's this joy you know that she has like you said she lights up you know yeah she's and it was great to see that in the film because I know in watching there were points where it felt not somber but just maybe me just knowing the litigation process of how draining it can be and just kind of you're looking for some like light or some mo- moment of like a win or whatever but they were really just mm-hmm. quiet moments where you got to see them having those smaller victories and may and that for her it seemed like it was getting back to dance in some form you know just watching mm-hmm. her balance her kids and but also choreographing in her head I mean those moments were really again you just have this eye for capturing what that journey was really about from so many different angles and her finding a way to tap back into that passion of loving to dance was is just as important part of the story and it's something for everybody to tap into exactly. I'm glad you did dance classes and didn't uh <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I mean I think sometimes people expect like in a in a narrative like oh it should be this ultimate glorious win thing or something like she yeah. goes in like punches Roger Goodell in the face I don't know whatever people <laughs> would expect like to happen but it's about those small victories and I think that's what's real life like in our everyday life and you know we should all try to appreciate those things because sometimes they don't happen very often but when they do it's like hold on to that hold feeling. On to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you have any uh, questions for me before we wrap up? I wrote down one question that because again, like as I was listening to the, all the episodes of your <laughs> podcast and hearing different women's experiences, like especially the one that like part two to the fighter one where um, Chrisanne and you were talking about like the men- sort of the mental health aspect and like mm-hmm. how those things were also affecting her physical body and things like that. And but you didn't talk that much, but you were like agreeing with her, basically saying like, you know, you went through some similar situations as well. And like the other episodes we're talking about, like, you know, bullying within the team and things like that. Like, and you see like, that's such a commonality. And, you know, in my experience of talking to the women too, like, do you think it's possible to have NFL pro cheerleading culture or dynamic that is free from that kind of like authoritarianism and that you know, that kind of culture of fear and, you know what I mean? Like, is it possible to have a better vibe going going on? <laughs> like, and in that extremely competitive environment. Like, I understand how it is so competitive, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think my answer to that would be totally dependent upon who your leader and coach is. Mm. Um, because I think it's absolutely possible. Um, with the right leadership because I guess what I envision for any pro dancer knowing how competitive the process is the auditions process and selecting who's on your team is probably so very difficult to arrive at but once you have your squad assembled in my mind I would approach treating everybody who's on the team as though they are pro bowl cheerleaders like you are the creme de la creme and I value each and every single one of you and what you bring to the table. I handpicked you and selected you based on what I thought you had to offer. And so the way that I think you can eliminate a lot of that mean girl activity, the competitiveness, the obsession of just nitpicking and you know tearing people down and apart is really just acknowledging them for the diversity that they bring to your program being willing to promote that and uplift everyone and having them all get to know one another and understand who they have as teammates so that you're probably more inclined to, to care for your teammate because you understand a little bit more about their story. Maybe you have single parents that are, I don't know, balancing Lord knows what, maybe there are people who are really going through a lot at home or with their parents, you know, you never really know, but I just think if you're leading your team in a way where they're actually coming together as a team. And it's a job, but it's also something where you spend so much time together and you're united around, I would say, a mission that's a little bit different. You know, I don't go to work at my job today and and (laughs) strive for this level of connection with people. Um, But I just think because of the role that we have is so unique as pro cheerleaders and dancers when you're on a team, I just think if the leaders actually approached it in a way where they 
truly celebrated the, the people that make up their team where everybody shines. There's room for everybody to kind of have that spotlight. There's not one star. There aren't favorites. There are natural leaders that you recognize in each and every one of them. And then the people that you have as a squad leader are people who you know will reinforce that level of leadership and treat everybody equally on their little mini squad. And I just think that kind of mentality and that approach to leading would change the whole experience for everybody. We want, you know, if you really do want everybody to win and everybody to shine and everybody to grow, I just think you would lead from that. And I think everybody's experience, it's not all peaches and cream and roses, but at the same time, you can eliminate a lot. There's no need to lead with fear. If you can be clear about your expectations, you can, again, treat people with respect and, and command that respect in the way that they treat you. And just kind of give them a sense of a bigger picture of what they're a part of, right? I mean, this isn't really about you, individual cheerleader over there who's, you know, obsessed with yourself. And, you know, like this is a bigger picture, larger mission. And I just think if you kind of can communicate that in a way that's inspiring to everybody, where they're all proud to be associated with it, that's what it should be like. That's what I want it to be like for everybody. And I know that depending on the coach or the leader or your squad leader or whatever, it can completely change your entire perspective. And this is supposed to be the happiest experience that you'll ever have. You'll never have anything like it. So it's for it yeah. to be painted because. And it's in your prime of your life. Yeah, your life, you're looking, your body's banging, you're like everything's yeah. going. I mean, this is, this is what you train for. You can eliminate a lot of that. I personally think you can have a world as an NFL cheerleader, NBA dancer, pro dancer, pro cheerleader to have a very, very positive experience just based on the leadership. And of course, this is the leader of your team. But I think if in the broader organization, you're also, hopefully there's a culture where they value that team and they kind of, yeah, all starts at the top. Well, I think getting this film green lighted, getting the work done, shout out to your crew and everybody that was involved in putting this together, all the people who funded the film, just super grateful that this is out there for everybody to see soon, everyone to be able to see. But thank you so much for your time and talking to the podcast and our listeners, because I think there's been a lot of interest and this is a little snippet preview of what they can expect from the film. I cannot wait for the conversation that it generates and we'll definitely be sharing all of your information and getting some good sound bites for people to, uh, <laughs> you know, have a little preview, just a little hint yeah, of what yeah. they, what they have in store. Thank you so much. I feel like we've met and have known each other for so long already just from conversations, but I cannot wait to meet you in person and yes, you know, hopefully Seattle will be a safer place to be in at that time. Thank you for all your hard work and dedication and just interest in shining a light on this world. I mean, you're a part of it now. So (laughs) (laughs) there's one thing that I'm going to ask you to do is take back to all the women that you're in contact with that have gone through this process that feel like a black sheep. Can you please tell them from Akiba Pate from the Pro Chilling Podcast, they're not black sheep. They are a part of this world and they contributed to this world being a better place and they are absolutely not black sheep. Aw, wow. They're, I'm so grateful to not, hear that. They're always welcome here. We can just talk about anything other than their lawsuit if they want to. Whatever they want to share, it can be all the favorite memories that they have from their time on the team. It can be whatever they want it to be, but they have a voice. They've exercised it. I applaud them for it and the door is wide open so please take wow, that wow that's awesome i will i will definitely let them know cool cool this has been amazing i will definitely post all of your information below for everybody to find out more about you and your other films and your work and to stay tuned to when they can watch a woman's work thank you so much we <laughs> thank you Thanks so much for listening to the Pro Cheerleading Podcast. You can follow your favorite podcast on social media at Pro Cheerleading Podcast on Instagram, at Pro Cheer Podcast on Twitter. We're on Facebook, on YouTube, and you can support your favorite podcast on Patreon. Until next time, keep your eyes on the sidelines.